That's Mike. Michael, Michael Thomas from the Transition Movement in the UK. That's your stage and that's your applause. <laughs> Have fun. Hi, everyone. Um, just like to say a big thank you for uh, Fusion for having me back again. I came a couple of years ago and did a talk about the transition movement. For people who don't know, transition movement is uh, an international network of organizations which support bottom-up, community-led social change. So it's uh, organizations uh, based in local communities who are looking at how they can restructure their local economy, energy, food, and all, all the stuff which basically infrastructure within their, the local area. So I work for the organization Transition Network, which supports the whole international movement. And very recently, we were considering how we can change how our organization is structured in order to make us a much more agile, responsive, and non-hierarchical organization. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is about how we developed what we call shared governance. And shared governance is based on several different models, predominantly sociocracy and holacracy, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. Everything that you're going to see in the presentation on the screen today comes out of a guide that we have, which you can download online. And in the box here by the camera, there's a li little strips with the web site address. So anyone who wants to um, learn more and use these techniques in their group, you can find everything on there. OK. So this was one of the big things that we thought about, is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, which was a quote by Albert Einstein. And we worked very closely with an organization called University de Nou. And with them, we wanted to explore what, how we could reinvent what is at the center of the organization and the source of the many problems within Transition Network. And the two things that that, that involved looking at was how, how we govern the organization and how the interactions amongst individuals happen within that organization. So working very closely with University de Nou, they invited us to look at what happens between the I as in the individual and the we as in terms of the group. And how we can progress towards a model which is far more cooperative. Part of that made us understand that it's not just about the external reality, it's also about the internal reality of individuals which is also a really important aspect of how groups operate and develop. And there's also very much a link between personal and organizational transformation with, one of them, with each of them mirroring each other. So through doing this, we, it would enable us to thoroughly understand each other and decide together for all the benefit of all concerned. And it would also enable us to trust each other more and share our enthusiasm as well and stay in touch in difficult circumstances. A big part of this, and one thing which is actually extremely important, is that you have within your group that you have a shared organization uh, purpose for your organization and why your group exists. And there's five aspects to this. The first one is, what do you want as the individual? What I am. So how does, how does the group that you're involved in fulfill your own passions and desires for what you want to, one, see happen in the world, and two, how that group functions and what that group gives to you as an individual? Secondly, the what we want. So this is, what, what is the group? Within groups, you'll have maybe lots of different viewpoints and positions and ways of operating. So when you're looking, you need to understand how to search for common ground and create a shared vision that everyone in a group can sign up to in order for the group to be effective. And then the second three things are the pathways to your purpose. So the first one being what I feel is how can I call upon my intuitive emotional 
sensitive side that allows us to deepen a sense of purpose, whether it be personal or organizational. And then secondly, what we feel, which is listening to the center of the circle, which I'll talk a lot more about in a minute, which is to the us. So that is listening to everyone who's involved in your organization together to understand where people are coming from. And then thirdly, it's what we notice, reading concrete practical signs and data, not the facts that make up our singular identities, but looking at the wider picture, what is happening in the world and how the organization you're operating in is situated within that environment. So we, we spent a lot of time at Transition Network coming up with this purpose. It was actually quite a painful process, I must say, <laughs> and took a long time. Um, so we, what we came up with was Transition Network supports the transition movement, amplifies stories of community-led change, and nurtures collaborations across difference to challenge us all to reimagine and rebuild our world. That short sentence probably took about three, four months of this, not full on discussion, but over a period of three or four months to get to that. And what was great was when we finally did, everyone felt happy with it. So, which is a really important thing with, throughout this whole process is about how people have enough engagement in what's going on within your group in order to feel that they're not being dragged along by others or other power politics aren't coming into play where people don't feel like they can sign up. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about horizontality <laughs> and verticality. So for a long time, societies have operated very much on the hierarchical model. You know, so you have a boss, you know, the different subgroups which go down and down to the workers. And this is a pyramid model, very much theorized under a model called Taylorism, applied to companies after the Industrial Revolution, and a very mechanical view of, of management. I'm sure we all have worked in those sorts of organizations. So from the 1960s onwards, people developed different forms of organizing which were more horizontal. But then may, many people then became disenfranchised with a complete horizontal approach. So what we're seeing appearing now over the last sort of 20 years is what we've called ecological governance, which is very much about integrating um, horizontal ways of doing things, but also vertical ways. So transition, we, we use a combination of what we call holacracy, which is a circles-based model. And then we also have sociocracy, which is a consent decision-making, both of which I talk about. So a holocrit, holocratic sorry, model, it enables your organization to be far more agile. That means you're able to respond more quickly in a much more flexible way. And the basis of holocratic theory is that an organization exists for a reason defined by its purpose, which is why having a clear purpose in the very beginning is extremely important, because that purpose defines how everything else then operates underneath it. It's also based on the idea that the people who are involved in that organization are there to fulfill the purpose. And they do this through operating in circles. And that enables the organization to disseminate decision making through a factor organization of self-organized teams. In terms of being agile, it, what it helps you do is, in terms of making decisions, you can make a decision, you implement the decision, and then you can evaluate feedback very quickly on whether that decision has been the right decision, and then you can readjust. This process we use constantly in Transition Network now. So we have an overall plan 
of where, where we, what we would like to see happen in the world, but we don't stick to that plan rigidly in any way. So what happens is, as we're moving along, we, we respond to the change in environment through this agile process. So why work in a circle? Well, circles allow us to develop cooperative and collaborative spaces rather than competitive ones. They promote listening, dialogue, and creativity. And you can co-create decisions and projects, uh, projects sorry, through a process that is conducive to the development of collective intelligence. So through working within a circle, you, it enables you to harness all the intelligence from every individual who is within your group. Also, by working in a circle, it focuses attention on co-production, co-creation, and allows potential involvement of every person within the group. It also encourages free movement of ideas, facilitates knowledge sharing, boosts experience, improves involvement, and reinforces links between co-players within the organization. And the other thing, which is really interesting, is that it opens up a space for personal transformation. Because you have to really operate on the basis of trust in yourself, in others, and in the processes that you're using in order to be successful. This has actually been one of the biggest challenges I've found for moving, because we've moved from what would be a more hierarchical model to something much more based on circles. So we've had to go away from having someone who's the, the delivery manager, the person who's a, from a more hierarchical, the, the boss in that sense, to now we all collectively make decisions and feed into how the organization functions, what work we do, and how that, how that happens in, in reality. So very often, there's been sort of the, sub, the idea of verticality implies that there was submission to authority. So this was why, one of the major criticisms of why people started to look for more horizontal structures in, and how to operate their group, because they felt that it was a very top-down approach and people were being told what to do by a small group or one individual. When we talk about verticality in this model, what we're talking about is verticality is, sorry, is trust according to a new vision of power sharing. So what we're talking about is that we trust people, we give people power. We give them the authority to do things and the accountability to deliver on those things. So when a person is assigned to a role, whether elected or appointed, they are sovereign in that role. That means they can take that role and they can do however, whatever they see fit in order to deliver on that role. So they, if you're given, for example, we want you to do all the marketing for this part of the organization. They can do that in whatever way they want. So it's not like they, they are given that responsibility, that sovereignty, to do that in the way that they see best. They can also make certain decisions without consulting other roles, and they can choose whether to consult with others or not. So there's things what we call where you can have an advice process. So you could think, my friend knows a lot, a lot about this. I will go and speak to them. Or you could get call a meeting and get people together there and get advice from them on, on how you could fulfill that role. There's also safeguards, which is where the horizontal comes in. So circles practice management by consent and other participatory methods. Vertical energy flows from top to bottom as sub-circles responsibilities are defined by the upper circle. And it also circulates upwards through rep links, those members of sub-circles whose role is to rise up the information and who have a right to object in the upper circle. So you have power 
but also responsibility flowing across as well as up and down. So each subcircle in the organization is connected to other circles. And they, by when you have a lead link, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, and then you also have the rep link. So there's a two-way process happening which enables people to see and resolve tensions which come up. But also, the, the rep link can also be reporting back to this circle if there are problems here with the lead link, for example. Also, people who are lead links can have other roles within the organization where they're also running other circles. So the lead link is chosen by the upper circle. And they're given a responsibility to then run a project. If you think of circles as more like projects or responsibilities, it might be a bit simpler to understand. It's actually not as complicated as I'm probably making it sound at the moment. It's, <laughs> it took me quite a while to get my head around how it all functions. So here's a lot of the things that the lead link can do. But the lead link's primary role is to be responsible to deliver what that circle is. So my role as lead link in Transition Network is to oversee all the support infrastructure stuff which happens for the transition movement. That doesn't mean that I have any role in delivering that, though I do because I've been allocated other roles, but in my lead link role, I am just responsible for that, that circle delivering. And then I can devolve down to other people within that circle responsibilities, which I'll show you in a minute. So the rep link is a way of keeping a two-way communication happening between the circles. So it's, a bit, it's like a safety mechanism to have another voice reporting back up to the main circle. So circles in themselves, each one has a border in its own purpose. And they can self-organize however they want to deliver that purpose. And it self-structures its own governance. And it performs work via dynamic operative processes. If a circle has a, a really large border, it may include more specialized sub-circles where they give they devolve their responsibility to, again, deliver other roles, which you'll see in a minute. And the lead links connect to larger circles with sub-circles, and the rep links connect the sub-circles with larger circles as well. The dynamic steering is what I was talking about earlier, is where you move in very small steps. So rather than having a big, long, massive plan, what you do is you look at what the next thing is that you need to do. So we have this process here happens in what we call a sorting meeting. So a sorting meeting happens when you have everyone in that circle comes together and they will say, we have an update where each role updates what's, what's happening for them. And then they come up with then we ask, do you have any tensions that are stopping you moving from where you are now to the next step? A tension is not it's stopping you finally delivering the thing that you want to deliver. It's what's stopping you moving from here to here, <laughs> and then here to here, with the purpose, the final purpose being there. And what's, what's, what I find really interesting with that, in operating uh, um, within Transition Network is that you're always, all you're thinking about is how you move to the next, the next little bit to achieve what you want to achieve, which is a much better way of sort of achieving what you want to do without having to have long, lengthy conversations. Because you're only, the only thing you're allowed to bring up is do you have attention now? And the tension could be that I needed you to do this, but you haven't got time. So that I resolve that tension by saying, I need to speak to you about 
how we can manage your time so you can deliver the bit that I need to move forward. So in Transition Network, we have a primary circle. That primary circle there is where the purpose is set. And everybody in the organization has the same power at that, at that level. Then we've assigned, this is a, or is a lead link, the blue arrows. That lead link then assigns roles within the heart circle. This heart circle is the operating circle. So this, if you think of that as the brain, and this is the body, and then these are all the different limbs doing the things for the organization. So in the primary circle, I sit there and I make decisions with others around the purpose, the things that we're going to focus on as an organization, the roles that need to be developed, like pretty much everything. Then it goes down to the heart circle where I was elected lead link here. And then I'm responsible now for making sure that the supporting movement sub uh, circle here delivers its purpose. And the same again, these coming off here are other circles which may have specific roles within that. And this information flows back and forth between the circles. So you can have meetings within this circle to resolve tensions. If a tension can't be resolved here, it then goes back to the heart circle. Because it may be that the tension is, is related to these other circles, at which point we can resolve it there. If it's a major problem, it may be there's a problem with purpose, and it needs to go back to the primary circle. But this, uh, this happens very smoothly and very quickly once, once it's in place, and once everyone sort of understands where their position is. So I'm now going to talk a bit more about the keys to setting up what we call a shared governance model, which is all the things that you need in place in order for the circle's model to function properly. So firstly, we need to create what they call a, create an us. The us being the group. And that is how we work about doing and being together and recognizing the talents within that group. So an us is a set of eyes gathered around a common goal. So this is your group. This is your new group with each individual. They share common values, culture, and tools, and together they maintain meaningful links and relationships. And us is a set of individuals, each who's autonomous, independent, and different. So the necessary conditions for the emergence of an us is that elements of the system do not exercise control over one another. And that the system requires an external source of energy to set it in motion. This could be a project, a cause, a vision, and meaning. So there's five stages that groups go through before they get to an us. The first one is there's a newly constituted group. So this is basically when individuals get together at the very beginning of groups, of, of the group forming. So within the group, you'll have individual and collective anxiety, withdrawal, silence, abundant and untimely speech, and attempt to create an organization. If you've ever been involved in a group, a new group, you probably recognize these. Then the group moves into what we call a symbiotic us, where there's a strong need for compliance and equality, and everyone strives for, ex for acceptance. So this is where everyone's getting on, everyone's like really happy, you know, it seems like the group's functioning really, really well. And then you hit the conflicting us. And this is where individuals within the group feel a need to be different, to stand out, and attempt to be identified within that group by contrast against others. So the group dynamics that tends to happen at this stage 
you have stuff like rivalries, competing for power and leadership, and leaders within their groups protect their own borders to maintain their positions. Once you move through that stage, you become a more mature version where participants are reassured and recognized acting and relying on themselves. So the group dynamics that happen here are there's expressions of feeling, opinion, and belief, awareness of different frameworks, group dynamics, analysis, meta-level communication, that's communication, thinking of the organization as a whole, not just coming from the individual. And it feels like there's much less threats. It's a more non-judgmental. I think you can actually apply this to romantic relationships as well. <laughs> and then finally, this is the, you, you get to the position where you have the team. And this is where you're in a really well-functioning, effective group. And this is a space where people are in direct relationship, where tasks and roles are distributed by consent, and where we'll, all members work together towards common and clear goals. And the characteristics of this are that there's a desire to be close with others within the group and to be working towards that common goal, but there's also a desire to act and to be effective in how the group organizes and functions and delivers the stuff that it wants to do. You'll find that there's far more direct communication, so no manipulation or psychological games. People are much more self-aware, aware of others, and they also are able to see themselves functioning within the group. So they understand what their role is and what they may be doing within the organization. In terms of focusing on tasks, it's far more cooperative. There's different structures that are appropriate for the group. Accountabilities are given to each, distributed to each other, and roles are assigned. There's also a high level of solidarity with mutual trust and differences within the group are seen as the team's wealth rather than the conflict within it. And also people are happy and open to criticism. And also it satisfy, satisfies the individual's interests in pursuit of a collective goal. So organizations live at two levels. You have the formal structure, which is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about up till now, which is governance, agreements and rules, you know, the, how it operates technically and the financial resources. But then you also have all the informal processes, which is the group dynamics, how the interconnections within that group, the personal projects and the conflicts. So a working group is constantly tackling these two interrelated aspects. And it's really useful to bear in mind that you're all the time you're within both of these and they influence each other and affect each other. So a big part of working in this way involves what we call improving the inner posture. This is all about how the individual works within the organization. So it's about individuals listening to each other, cooperating, letting go of conflict, recognizing how your ego is playing out within the group, reassessing how what you may be doing and how your behavior is impacting on the group. Also, being a cooperative leader and supporter. So rather than being in competition, you're, you're there to support other people to deliver their role. And also observing observing yourself within the organization and how your part in that organization plays out. And you also have the sovereignty that we were talking about, aspects of confidentiality you may agree to, and also operating based on kindness and respect. A big part of that is what we call having a safety agreement. And a safety agreement is what's set up at the beginning of the group process when your group forms. And within that, you would have induction processes 
So that's, hey, does someone new come in and be involved in the group? Hey, do you welcome someone in? Then you have, hey, do people leave? What's a good exit process? Also, what sort of, so we, hey, hey, would someone be excluded from the group and on what basis? And then also, hey, do you, what is acceptable behavior within that framework? As well as, hey, do you deal with conflict? And hey, do you regulate tensions which are coming up in the group? And this is, this is really interesting because these, having this in place in the beginning means that everyone understands what the process is. And they understand what's acceptable, how, they, how people should be operating, and how best. It's not like there's these unwritten rules. It's all there, clear and plain for people to see. So the next part is you choose a decision-making process. And the one that we use is called consent. And I'll go through that in a minute. And we have two forms of consent. One is election by consent, and the other is decision by consent. So consent is very different to consensus. Who's used consensus here? <laughs> Who likes consensus? <laughs> so I've, I've been involved in groups where we've used consensus. I actually think it, it can work very well as long if, you're, if you don't have anyone particularly problematic in the group. But if, if it can be very much undermined by one individual. Whereas consent is, I think, a far better way of doing things. So the difference... The differences between consent and consensus is, in consensus, consensus, everybody has to say yes to the decision. They have to seek agreement, and it has to be positive and unanimous. And the big issue I have, which I have with consensus, is the block. And I, if people don't know what that is, it is basically one individual can block a decision. Also. Conflict can sometimes be demonized. Differences can be erased to reach consensus. So you come, on, you come up with a decision which is actually a very watered down decision of what was probably a really, could have been a really good proposal. And it can also lead to power games and all kinds of other stuff going on. So with consent, the difference is, is that nobody says no to a proposal. And I'll explain the process in a minute. But the, the debate is focused on how you process an objection. And what I find absolutely fascinating about this process is that someone has to have a, a really valid objection which makes sense in order to stop a decision being passed. And through, through the process, it enables you to see whether the, ob the objection is actually coming from a true place and not just an individual's view, point of view or their ego playing out. It's, it's a pretty simple process. You, you come up with a proposal by listening to the center. And that can be done through a whole range of different, different processes. Um, consultation discussions, which then lead to the development of a proposal. That proposal is then presented to the group within a circle. The first stage is everyone gets an opportunity to ask for clarification of that proposal. So if you do not understand what the proposal is, you can say, can you explain to me this a bit more? It's not about whether you like it or not. It's about whether you understand what's being presented. Secondly, you get an opportunity to then feed back what your feeling is about the proposal. Opinions, reactions, uh, advice on how it could be improved. <laughs> and then that leads to a process where the person who's put the proposal forward can clarify, amend, or withdraw the proposal. So you're using the collective intelligence of the group to refine the proposal to make it better. 
Then you get to the objections round. And the objections round is where you can say to the, the, the proposal that I've, I object to this decision, this proposal, because I feel it's either a massive threat to the purpose of the organization. I mean, that is predominantly, it has to be really concrete why you object. And so what happens is, when somebody objects, the facilitator of that process draws out from the individual what the, what the objection is. So it's very clear what the person is saying. Then, each object, so that goes around the whole circle. Everyone gets an opportunity to whether they want to object or not. And then each objection is dealt with one by one by the group. So this is an opportunity for everyone within the group to feed in to how that objection can be resolved. <clears throat> and then if the person, the person who objects is then happy that the objection has been resolved, the proposal can be passed or it can go back and be amended and the proposal will be put forward again and you would have another objection process. It can be quite a long, it can feel like it's a long process, but what I've noticed is that you come up with much stronger proposals and you've utilized all that intelligence in the room in order to develop it. And then most importantly, you have a celebration at the end. <laughs> you go, <"Whoa." laughs> So reason, reasonable objections are, you know, it, it has to be well argued. It has to say why, why it's going to cause a problem for the circle's mission. And it's considered unreasonable if it's based on a preference. This is what's really important. A preference is, I just don't like the proposal. I think we should do it this way. No. What's your objection to this proposal? And that's, that is the thing, I think, which is really, really important and what makes this very different to consensus. And also, there are other things, you know, if it's made against the person, if it's a personal opinion, if it's another proposal. All of that is not, is not considered a reasonable objection. So the next stage is you define who decides what. So you define the purpose of the roles, the authority over domains, the accountabilities, and then you assign roles. To assign a role, you can use a similar process called election by consent. The first part is the role is determined by the circle. So what the, po what the role is there for, its mission, how long it's going to last for, its responsibility, its tasks. How, sorry, again, how long it lasts for. And then you define, as a group, what you think the criteria are for that choice. So it could be, we need someone who's really good at web design, or we need someone who's really good at running groups, or we need someone who's good at marketing, or we need someone who can do whatever that role needs. So you, as a group, you come up with those list of criteria, and then everyone in, your, in the circle gets an opportunity to vote for either themselves or another person within the circle to be in that role. Then. Everyone then says to the group who they voted for and why. So they would say, I voted for Mike because I because of this. And then you after you've everyone's given their arguments for who they voted for and why, you then get an opportunity to switch your vote to someone else if you want. And this is the really interesting bit is the proposal is not based on how many votes someone gets. Anyone in the circle can put forward a proposal for that person in the role. And it's a, it's, so it's a spontaneous proposal. So after everyone's listened to everything, you then go, who would like to make a proposal for that person to be in that role? And they can go, I propose Mike. Then a very similar process happens is objections. So to see whether anyone actually objects to that individual being in that role. Again, the objections are treated one by one, and then there's a celebration at the end. Also, within circles, you have to have a facilitator and a secretary. The facilitator is the person who facilitates all these processes. 
The secretary is the person who records it. And then also you choose the lead link and the rep link that we talked about earlier. And that can all be done by election by consent that we just looked at. <coughs> Finally, the final bit is piloting the organization. And this is how the organization then moves forward once all that structure is in place. And this goes back again to what I was talking about in terms of being agile. So you're always looking at agility. So how, how you're feeling what's going on, what's happening at this moment in time with, with your group and where you want to get to. And then you can adjust that in the here and now and, and move to the next small action that you can take to move towards your goal. So all together, this is what it looks like. And it does take quite a while to get to this, but I think, in my, my experience, it's time very well spent. Because once you've done this, all those problems that groups have, I mean, you still will have problems in groups because individuals exist within them and we're all human, but you can much, as much more ability within this model to deal with those problems which are coming up and to move forward and be really effective in how your group functions. And that's it. And here is the link to the guide that all the slides are out of, and there's more resources here. And I've also printed that out in this box there by the camera. There's, um, if I can just pass them around. Oh, yeah, if, if you want to. So if anyone has any questions, I think we've got 15 minutes. Well, if you have some questions, I'm here with a microphone. Raise your hand and, uh, yeah, who has some come over there? It is a lot of information. <laughs> Just, uh, but the guide explains it all, so, yeah. Okay, uh, hi. Uh, hi. Thank for your talk, for your talk, first of all. <laughs> I have two small questions and one tricky question. Okay. Um, the first <laughs> one is how big, people-wise, is the organization you implemented the system in, too? So this, at the moment, is 12, 12, 12 people. people. Okay. Yeah, but you could, you, could use that, you could use this model in a huge com, um, organization because it's fractal. So the circles can play off each other and keep going. So if you had a really big organization, you could definitely use it in that. In fact, it's more, I think it's, more, it's harder to do it in a smaller organization. And one other thing I should mention, actually, is that we also have this thing that there's anything which isn't forbidden, you can do. So it, within your safety agreement, you might have things like, we can't do this because it will bring the organization into disrepute. Or, you, or for example, the transition network we have, you can't spend all the money without getting <laughs> a decision made at a certain point. But okay. apart from that, everything else you can do within. All right, I get it. Um, second small question is, how long did it take you? Like from the point where you decide, okay, we want to implement it now, mm to the point where you said, okay, it's working now. I mean, we see the risk and the, the exhaustions, I don't know yeah. the better word, uh, implementing it, and, but we also see the benefits. Okay, so we've been running under this structure full time since, uh, for about three months now. But prior to that, we were using a lot of the processes, yeah, three months, and we were using, but we were using a lot of the processes in the preceding 18 months. But because we're, Oh, we're a bit like, as one, one of my f colleagues said, we're like a plane that's flying along, but you're also trying to rebuild the plane as it's flying, because obviously we're still implementing, having to deliver all our work. So it took, uh, it took a lot longer than if you were starting from scratch, from you know the beginning, like a new group, it would be a lot quicker. Okay, uh, third question is during the implementation phase, like when you, uh, trying things out, and I guess many problems were popping up, mm. and sometimes there's a, like a handy trick how you can solve them, like a little story, like a problem everyone was concerned about, and then you use the system to solve it. Mm. Is there like a neat little story? Um, I mean, there's the, the, one of the big problems, believe it or not, 
is, and it's not, this isn't really a story, but one of the biggest issues we found is the, the concept of sovereignty, the idea of an individual taking on power and responsibility to deliver something. Actually, people are, have really struggled to do that, to feel like they can just go ahead without having to talk to anyone anymore. <laughs> so, like, you would have thought that it would be the other way around. And that's what's really interesting, is that actually giving, giving power back to people, the, taking that power on, is quite a challenge, particularly if you have a lot of roles. So, for example, the other, uh, two weeks ago, I oversee the support circle, and I can define who the, how the budget is distributed, the money within that circle. Yeah, I didn't feel like I could do that. I felt like I had to speak to everyone. And then everyone in the circle was saying, no, you can decide. And I was like, whoa, OK. So it's, that was quite interesting. Hey, the power shifts are, are quite, it's quite a mindset. You have to change your psychology of how you function within this model. Like the objection being a gift. You know, the objection being seen as a gift, not as a barrier. Is, is the ever big, the two big things that I've noticed was, was that, the objection and the taking more power. Who's gonna be next? Oh, in the bag. Bear with me. Here we go. Hi, um, where's the accent from? That's the first question. <laughs> Uh, number two is um, we are also going through a transition phase in the organisation that I work for, and I can't figure out if it's the chicken or the egg problem. But first, do you train people, then implement the restructure, or restructure and then train people to live in that new structure? Okay, the the first question is easy. <laughs> I'm from the Forest of Dean in the UK. <laughs> And so is Andy. <laughs> and I, I also live in Bristol now, which is very similar. Um, what we did at Transition Network is we, we had a process of introducing like the consent decision making we used a lot before we changed the structure of the organization to a circles model. When we, we had several away days where we spent a lot of time working with the organization, University to New, through to look at how we should function as an organization. So it was a long process. I think we, we did a lot of training and preparation before we moved to the model. Yeah. But that's because we're, the existing structures was already there. So it makes it more difficult because you're trying to fit the old structure into the new one in, for a little bit as, as you trans, transition to the new Completely, if that makes sense. Who's going to be next? Here we go. Uh, thank Hi. you for the great input. Um, my question is, how do you deal with... Like, when, you're implementing, when you're implementing new structures, it means a lot of insecurity for a lot of people. Um, so they're trying to take an over control. Um, there come psychological games that you mentioned. How do you deal with that in a group um, while you're also protecting people and not making a therapy session? That's a very good question. And <laughs> I would say that the, the safety agreement, which I talked about earlier, about the inclusion, exclusion, what the boundaries are, how the group functions, what's acceptable behavior, is really important and you have to take people along with you so that the, one of the beauties of, of the model is that you're moving to something which is far more democratic and allows each voice to be heard so I think that you're it is problematic at times I felt like I was losing the will to live and that we <laughs> that we weren't doing anything that we should be doing and that Ah, why, why are we just not getting on with work? But I now really see the value in, in doing that. Um, but the big, the big thing is, you, you'll also find that people will leave. You know, if people aren't happy, they may leave the group. Um, 
But in terms of power and how power plays out, I think a big part of that is dealt with within the consent decision-making process, an election by consent process. And the main thing is, if, you, if everyone within your group is signed up to the group's purpose and wanting the group to be effective in what it does, it's a lot easier. If you have a lot of pe if you have people within the group who aren't signed up to the purpose, that that makes it a lot more problematic. Um, and you know, we have we have a whole process for dealing with conflict as well, which I haven't talked about. But we decide you know you decide on your process for dealing with that. I think that does that answer your question? Yeah. Who's going to be next? Oh, over here. Just a small question regarding the last one. How do you define, or who gets to define, what objection is valid? So, like, you, how do you define if, like, you mentioned the ego problems? Mm. Uh, who, who gets to choose whether it's like maybe somebody has an ego problem, but also uh, a valid mm. uh, objection? Yeah. Well, if, if it's a valid objection, the ego problem is not an issue. Because if the objection is valid, this is the trust in the process. So, if you have um, and this actually takes quite a long time to get your head reined, but now I've used consent a lot. The ego, if the ego is bringing up a valid objection, then that objection should be treated. If the ego is bringing up not a valid objection, when the person who facilitates that process will say, well, will say, well what is the objection? I don't understand what you're objecting. Because it, it becomes very clear when, it's, uh, when it is an objection and when it's not. And then you have the collective intelligence of the group going, well, I don't really understand the objection. Can you explain? And then by through that interaction, the person either withdraws the objection because they begin to look a bit stupid, to be honest, because it isn't valid. You know, what they're saying isn't valid on, based on that proposal. Or it becomes resolved because people offer suggestions on how to resolve what their objection is. It is sort of, it does work really well. I, 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 got, I had this question when I did this, a similar talk before, and everyone was just like, yeah, but what if, what if? And my advice was, try it. Just keep trying it. And then you see the beauty of the process. It does really, uh, it, re it works really well. But if take it away and try it and let me know. <laughs> Mike, next question is over here. I'd like to know if you think that your model is like a chance for a new approach to organize society, or do you think it would only work within peer groups? No, no, I think you could have this, this model could be used um, a, a much larger scale. But again, you would need to be, you would, it, it's very much based on trust. So you would have to trust that the people who are representing your circle are representing back to the center circle what, what your views are. But that's why you have the lead link and the rep link. So the lead link is feeding up to the next circle. You could have infinite circles. You know, you could have a thousand linking down and they could all be feeding back up to the primary way of organizing. But the, the key thing is that you need to have agreement on what the purpose of that structure is. You know, so you can, it would be quite difficult having, um, lots of different sets of circles with different purposes. You know, because within Transition Network, as we saw at the start, we have our purpose, this, like our tagline, our statement. So we are all signed up to that. If that, does that, if that makes sense, yeah. Do we have more questions? Oh, over here, that's easy. Um, so if I got it correct, uh, you, uh, you propose to make a transition to different process. Mm make decisions and so on. And if it's a formed group, um, what do you think? Can it be challenging that the group members, they maybe are not willing to make a change because they, are, feel, they feel comfortable with the way things are going and they might be resistant to actually do this extra effort to change the way yeah. they behave and they make decisions. And if you faced it, uh, how did you overcome these resistances? I mean, we, did, we didn't face that particularly, but the but we did do, so we did all this work to get to the position of going to this new model. And then we had 
that the final process was we did a consent decision making round on whether the organization should stay as it is or move to this new model. And in that process, people then had an, an opportunity to object. So we could, have, we could have done all this work <laughs> over what was probably 18 months, and still, at that point, someone could have gone, object, and we would have had to either resolve, try to resolve that objection, or go, then go away and come up with a new proposal. Only if the objection is valid, though. And it also may be that the individuals, if you're trying to move to a different structure, which is far more uh, democratic, and people have defined positions of power within your organization, it may be that those people shouldn't be in your organization. It might, you know, if they're not willing to give up the power and move to this new model, that's the, and that's something that you, you know, you need to work out how you deal with that, really. I don't think that's an easy, easy thing to particularly deal with. Um, Mike, yeah? we are running out of time. It's okay. <laughs> um, just a reminder, you have prepared those yeah. strips over there, so if you need the links, yeah, these links, just feel free to grab them. Yeah. Feel free to grab Mike after the talk. I'm yeah. sure he's going to be somewhere there and you can grab him. And Mike, that's your applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.